want to welcome you to another session of the Grace Institute of Biblical Study. This is our Pondering the Page course relative to seven key truths you can't afford to forget if you want to do God's will, God's way, for God's glory. I invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of 2 Timothy as we consider these seven key truths. Now, you know from the past that each of them begins with an M. I would hope that by now you would have all seven memorized. In fact, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to write down those seven words that there is a blank on your handout for. And again, each of them starts with an M. Okay, our time is gone. Again, seven key truths you can't afford to forget. You will need to remember, first of all, your mission. Your mission. This is found in verse 2. Secondly, your means. This is found in verse 1. Number three, your message. This is also found in verse 2. Your mindset, your mental focus, your method, and your motives. If you will be faithful to do God's will, God's way, for God's glory. All done by God's incredible grace. Mission means message, mindset, mental focus, method, motives. I'd encourage you to memorize them as this can be helpful in your own walk growth and ministry for Jesus Christ. Now, we're starting to break this down into principles in light of those M's. And principle number one was found in verse two, that God wants you to recognize the significant mission he has entrusted to faithful men to teach others also. Again, the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses the same commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And so we see the concept of entrusting. Entrusting these things to who? To faithful men with what objective in view who will be able to teach others also. This is what our mission involves. This is the Pauline version of the Great Commission, whether it be starting with the gospel and then the teaching of the word of God for the purpose of believers coming to know and grow and be fruitful for Jesus Christ as he is building his church in this present dispensation of grace. Principle number two, God wants you to remember the spiritual means he has provided for you to accomplish this ministry. And this is rooted in verse 1. In fact, apart from verse 1, you would look at this as a series of commands in which you're going to have to roll up your sleeves and crank it out, pump it out, try your best. But if you understand verse 1, you will realize that all of these things are accomplished on a grace basis and means. You therefore, my son, be strong. Literally, keep on being strengthened in or by means of the grace that is found in Christ Jesus. So we're reminded again of our source of everything is the Lord Jesus. We recognize that we've been co-crucified, co-buried, co-risen, co-ascended, co-seated in the heavenlies in him. And we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. And in light of this, we are to present ourselves to God as being alive from the dead because we are alive from the dead. And we're to yield ourselves to the Lord as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. As we think of those grace resources, we think of the word of God, as we have a completed copy of the scripture, and God's word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. It is a source of spiritual growth, of, of 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It's our means of divine viewpoint. It's how we get the mind of Christ, and on and on we go. And we have that wonderful resource of the Spirit of God who desires to fill us, desires to teach us the Word of God, desires to enable us to see these truths fulfilled in our life as we rely upon the Lord and not ourselves. We think the valuable resource of prayer, how we can go to the Lord in prayer and to the throne of grace in our times of need. For it's all by God's grace from beginning to end, for he gives more grace. Keep in mind, when I'm weak, I am strong. His grace is sufficient for you. Whatever he calls you to do, he will give you the grace to fulfill it. Our desire should be to abide in him, as a branch abides in the vine, so the life of the vine can flow through the branch and produce the fruit that the branch could never produce by itself. And the task ahead of you, dear students, is never as great as the power behind you, as we're to be strong in the Lord. Literally, keep on being strengthened in the Lord and in his mighty power, Ephesians 6, verse 10, reminds us of. And so you have learned in the past, 2 Corinthians 3, 5 and 6, and you must not forget it. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the Spirit, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And that is why I mentioned last time that ministry takes place, Warren Wiersbe states, when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels to the glory of God. Principle number three, which we will consider tonight, is that God wants you to realize the supreme message that he wants communicated to others. Not only our mission, and means, but now we're talking about our message. And in fact, apart from our message, we would be totally missing the target. We'd be totally missing what God really wants to accomplish. For you see, the things that you have heard from me, among many witnesses, you commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The things is a way of Paul stating the truths that you have learned. The word of God that I have taught you, the sound doctrine you've been privy to, I want you to commit these truths to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And by the way, what is the primary message Paul had in mind? The message first and foremost of the gospel, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And what then is built upon this message are not only justification by grace through faith alone and salvation from sin's penalty and the security of the believer in Christ, but then sanctification by God's grace alone through faith alone and salvation from sin's power as we walk by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. And ultimately in view will be our future glorification by God's grace and salvation from sin's presence. And the gospel of grace forms the foundation for justification by grace, sanctification by grace, and glorification by grace. And it's so important that we remember that. That's why the gospel isn't just something for unbelievers to hear, to be justified before God and saved from the penalty of their sins. Though that is true, it goes way beyond that and forms the very basis for the living of the Christian life as well. By the way, is there a great need for this teaching today in the United States and around the world? Does a dog bark? Does a cat meow? Do we get snow and cold in the winter in Minnesota? Of course. This is tremendously true everywhere we go. And everywhere we go, we have been met with a lot of positive volition. 
people willing to respond as long as they can be convinced from the scriptures. Now, we've also been met with some opposition, but what else is new? Everywhere in the pages of the book of John, you will see belief and unbelief, chapter by chapter, as people respond to the truth or they react in unbelief. Wherever Paul went, there were those who responded and those who rejected. The same will be true with your message as you preach the message of grace. On the other hand, there's some tremendous positive responses. As we think of the gospel, years ago, John Wesley said, untold millions are still untold. And it's no longer millions, it's now billions of people. William Carey said, to know the will of God, we need an open Bible and an open map. Why? Because we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Oswald Smith said years ago, why should anyone hear the gospel twice before everyone hears it once? You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. For you see, as it's been said before, you brought nothing into the world, and it's certain you'll bring nothing out. But I could add a caveat. The exception is those you lead to Christ, whether it be your children, whether it be those in your neighborhood, on the job, or wherever the Lord leads you, to be a witness for Christ, not only by your life, but by your lip, as you preach the gospel and live in a way that's honoring to the Lord. Now, what usually happens when we teach Romans 1 through 8, for example, in various countries, is that is the first series of teaching we normally do wherever we go. Well, there's usually a spiritual crisis. We've seen this in every country we go to. And the crisis is by virtue of the fact that they are now seeing the difference between a clear gospel and a garbled or wrong gospel. The difference between being saved by grace alone, through faith alone, Christ alone, and the finished work of Christ alone, or some kind of works that are added to the message. And as a result, there's a crisis, sometimes in their own life, sometimes regarding the assurance of their own salvation, or in some cases regarding what they have been preaching and in the inaccuracies that have been there. And that's why when we go to another country, we have a questionnaire we fill out, very simple questionnaire. And while we've done uh, probably 3,000 of those in different places, there's only been, I think, about 13 that ever have gotten it right the first time. There used to be only three, but in Gambia there were at least 10 that got it right the first time because of some sound teaching they had had before. Praise the Lord for that. But normally when we go through Romans and we teach it a second time, or excuse me, we give them the questionnaire a second time, they're usually at about 75%, and I think it would even be higher, except for the fact that students sometimes come and go due to other commitments, so there are gaps in their thinking. The 75% are usually those who um, have been there for the entirety of the teaching. And that's why we always encourage that. Is there a great need for this teaching today in the United States and around the world? Well, of course there is. There's a great need for clarity on the gospel of grace. There is a great need for clarity on eternal security and the absolute assurance of eternal salvation. There's a great need for teaching on identification or positional truth and the believer's completeness in Christ. There is a great need for teaching how to walk by faith in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, apart from legalism, mysticism, and license. There is a great need for a normal, literal, historical, grammatical interpretation of the Scripture, resulting in crucial dispensational distinctions, like Israel versus the church, law versus grace, church versus kingdom teaching, etc., and you've had that in biblical distinctions. You understand that. You've had that emphasis on, on bibliology, and why we interpret the Bible that way, and why the Bible has a precedence in showing us how we are to interpret it. Number six, there is a need for understanding the key place of the local church in the plan of God, which understands spiritual servant leadership, healthy body life and teamwork, the equipping of the saints, etc. There's a need for interest in prophetic truth, like the pre-tribulational rapture of the church and its blessed, purifying, and comforting hope. 
So there's a great need wherever we go for sound biblical doctrine. Now, having said that, I'd like to devote the remainder of our time together to clarify why we are not a Baptist church by conviction. And I say that because sometimes people wonder, are we Baptist? Because there are some similarities. There's no question about it. On the other hand, there are some significant distinctions. And so what I'm about to say isn't limited to Baptist churches. And it's not necessarily true of every Baptist church, so I'm making some general statements. But I want you to understand some very significant differences as it relates to sound doctrine and the teaching of grace. So let me make these caveats. First of all, every church has an emphasis in certain distinctives, including DBC. The Catholic Church has an emphasis in distinctive on sacramental grace, Mary, the priesthood, and so forth. The Lutheran Church has certain distinctives, such as at water baptism, as a bit, you become a child of God. The Charismatic Church has certain distinctives. The Pentecostal Church, they emphasize spiritual gifts. That is their emphasis, that is their distinctives. The same is true with Baptist churches and the true same is true normally of Bible churches as well. And so every church has an emphasis and a distinctive. The question simply is, is it biblical or not? That's the issue. You see, the emphasis on DBC, of DBC, is on Jesus Christ. As presented in the gospel and the teachings of God's grace for justification, sanctification, glorification. We really believe the biblical emphasis is that as Jesus said in John 16, 13, that the Holy Spirit would glorify me, Jesus Christ. And that when we see that emphasis for both our, uh, for, for our justification, for our sanctification, for our glorification, that is the right emphasis. Furthermore, that is secured in a greater way through verse-by-verse -verse expositional teaching of books of the Bible. So things are understood in a contextual way with the emphasis that the Bible has. And therefore, I want to note also there are a variety of Baptist churches in the world and USA. There's a variety. There's all kinds of Baptist denominations, as well as there's independent kind of Baptist churches. I recognize there's a, you know, a lot of different flavors of Baptists. And so keep in mind that my comments involve generalities and norms with a Philippians 1.18 perspective. This may not fit every Baptist church, and frankly, sometimes there's Bible churches that are like Baptist churches. There may be Baptist churches that are more like Bible churches, especially if the pastor went to a non-Baptist school. And so I'm making generalities here, and I don't know every church out there, and therefore I can't. I'm just making generalities and norms that I have observed over the years. And the Philippians 1.18 perspective is this. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. You know, whatever church it is, if they're preaching the gospel clearly and people are getting saved, hallelujah, praise the Lord. To whatever degree one may be able to fellowship with or work together with another local church is predicated on the similarity of doctrine, like-mindedness, building of trust, and so forth and so forth. But when Christ is preached, we rejoice. When the gospel is being presented, hallelujah. People are getting saved. Hey, that is the bottom line. To God be the glory, great things he has done. And so keep all of that in mind as I seek to differentiate these various things. Now, the predominant problem that I see in Baptist churches is legalism. And remember, legalism is that mental attitude and belief that one can be either justified and or sanctified by religious rituals or works. Sometimes it shows itself in their presentation of the gospel. Sometimes it shows itself in how they view the Christian life. Sometimes it shows itself 
by way of eternal security or not, or having some kind of Baptist twist on that security and so forth. And I will explain this in a little bit. But the bottom line normally involves legalism. And one of the things that legalism usually emphasizes is the externals instead of the internals and ultimately the eternals. Now let me just demonstrate how this shows itself regarding first tense salvation. The problem of either a wrong or garbled gospel it's oftentimes the case in Baptist churches. As repent or confess your sins, as Jesus in your heart, pray a prayer such as the sinner's prayer, make a commitment to Christ, submit or surrender to Christ as Lord, etc. Those wrong responses are predominant in Baptist churches. Again, not limited to Baptist churches, but so often the case. In fact, just recently, I happened to attend a, uh, a, a music concert of a... Uh, gospel singing group that I enjoy. My wife and I went to this, and in doing so, the, the evangelist got up after the group and went through a Romans presentation of the gospel. Romans 3.10, Romans 3.19 and 20, Romans 3.21 through 25, and everything he said as he intersected with those verses was right on. But then when it came to how to be saved, Instead of seeing all the verses he had just mentioned on faith, 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 he then goes to Romans 10, 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And frankly, that is a quote from Joel 2 related to the national salvation of Israel. And he's simply emphasizing the whosoever in the Romans 10 passage, as it also is related to the nation of Israel in Romans 10. And it's incredible to me with all the times the word believe is found in Romans and the word call is found once or twice, I think twice, that he would emphasize call instead of believe, believe, believe. And he would go into a, a section dealing with Israel, Romans 19 and 11, versus personal justification, chapters 3 and 4 of Romans. And yet that's what they did. And so it's not uncommon to say it's just by faith. Now, if you only would repent of your sins and ask Jesus in your heart and pray this prayer that you can ask, you can cry out to the Lord, you can make your commitment to Christ, you can submit to him, you can surrender to him as well. You know what? And they just undermine the whole issue of simple faith in Jesus Christ and the finished work. Now, being a Gibbs student, you've heard this explained many times. So this is not new to you, but this is pre very predominant. In fact, frankly, I have know of very few Baptist churches, just personally, I'm not saying there's not some out there, that don't garble the gospel. They usually get right up to the punchline, and then you hear something like this, and obviously that's problematic. Another problem in Baptist churches is the growing inroads of Calvinistic confusion. That confuses the gospel, undermines assurance, etc. Now, this is, has become increasingly true in the last 30 years or so, primarily due to the influence of John Piper, John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, Paul Washer, and others. Calvinism has made inroads in Baptist churches like never before historically. And as a result, they've oftentimes embraced and teach a lordship salvation. That, again, subsumed under faith is repentance from sin, submission to Christ's lordship, evidenced by ongoing fruitfulness or faithfulness, or you were never really saved. And so even while many of them would believe in eternal, secu well, eternal security, some would believe in the perseverance of the saints, but they wouldn't say, in essence, if you're really saved, if you are a true believer, you will persevere in faith all the days of your life, and you will be a fruitful believer with ongoing fruit, or you're just not genuine, you're not really saved. Now, is it true that there are people who claim to be saved but aren't really saved? Yeah, absolutely. But they're not really saved because they haven't put their faith in Christ alone. 
In fact, even these garbled responses oftentimes confuse the issue. So when you talk to them, so are you saved? They'll say, well, I did repent of my sin. Yeah, I did ask Jesus in my heart. Yeah, I did pray the prayer. I went for I prayed the prayer. I'm saved. Wait a second. What must I do to be saved? The answer is only believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But this Calvinistic confusion now has seeped in. And if one is a five-point consistent Calvinist, they will inevitably believe in perseverance, which means they will be a lordship salvationist in their gospel presentation, and they will garble and confuse the gospel. And this is increasingly true out there with people like Ray Comfort, who's really good at getting you lost and really bad at getting you saved. He's not clear on how to be saved. And then there's the problem of what I would call Christian life legalism. And this reflects itself in a number of ways. For example, water baptism is the first step to sanctification, which means spirituality by works, and it's necessary to join the church and then, quote, serve the Lord after signing the church covenant. Now, this is true sometimes in Bible churches do the same kind of thinking. Now, I'm not against water baptism. I'm all for it. For believers as a testimony of their faith and identification with Christ subsequent to their salvation. It may happen soon after. It may happen down the road. It depends how much baggage they're carrying, and they have to be convinced of the truth of it and be able to do it as unto the Lord. It doesn't make them spiritual. It simply gives them an opportunity to give testimony of their faith in Christ. But you see, in that Baptist approach, sometimes you come forward on Sunday morning at the altar and you get saved, and on Sunday night you're getting baptized and joining the church, because if you're not baptized, you can't really serve the Lord. If you're not a member of the church, you can't serve the Lord, at least in the church, which is ironic because if you go to those churches, they'll let you give so you can't, quote, serve unless you're a member of the church. And so often in the church covenant, you promise to not drink and smoke and chew and tattle and da-da-da-da-da, and you make all these so-called promises and vows to God. And frankly, you can't find that in Scripture. You don't see any church covenants like that. You don't see that they had to get baptized to join the church. The moment you place your faith in Christ, you're part of the church, the universal church. And, and, and you then should take responsibility, if possible, to be part of a Bible-believing church in your area so that you would not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. But all these other things that are attached, just they're foreign to the Word of God. They've connected dots that aren't designed to be connected. Sometimes they make efforts to dedicate or rededicate your life to Christ instead of understanding Romans 6 and 8, Romans 12, 1 and 2, and learning to walk by faith with the confession of sin is needed. Now, this is important. It's very common in Baptist churches because they don't understand a moment by moment walk by faith under the filling of the Spirit that they'll have these dedication, rededication services which oftentimes you come forward and you dedicate your life to Christ, that you are going to now finally walk with him, serve him, or whatever. Now, it is true that there has to come a point in your thinking as a believer, hopefully soon after, where you make a choice to want to present yourself to the Lord, that you want to live for him who died for you. Again, that's not what happens at salvation. That is a result of salvation. But it's not a matter of dedicating or rededicating your flesh in many cases to the Lord. It's recognizing I've been crucified with Christ, I've been buried with Christ, I've been risen with Christ. I reckon myself, I'm dead to sin, I'm alive to God. I now present myself to the Lord as one who is alive from the dead. And as a result, I want to walk in yielded dependence upon you, relying on your word for direction and your spirit for strength as I live the Christian life from day to day and grow in grace and serve you in loving obedience, motivated and enabled by the 
the resources you have provided. And that's very different than this dedicate and rededicate and usually try harder approach to the Christian life. Along that same lines, Christian life legalism, you'll see this seeking to do your best for Jesus kind of thinking instead of letting him do his best through you by the Holy Spirit. Now, it is true, whatever we do, we're to do heartily as unto the Lord. But it's not a matter of I'm just trying to do my best for Jesus. No, no. I'm walking in yielded dependence upon the Lord so that he can work in me and through me and produce his best through me for his honor and for his glory. There's a great difference between that. Remember, as we learned in Romans, active dependence, passive production. And that's where the faith rest life comes in. Another way of approaching this legalistic Christian life is an obey to be spiritual explanation of spirituality instead of vice versa. Sometimes I ask people, no, let me ask you a question. Do you have to obey to be spiritual or spiritual to obey? And if they say obey to be spiritual, they're missing the point. If you, can, if you have to obey to be spiritual, by whose strength are you going to obey? Through the flesh. <laughs> In order to be filled with the Spirit, it's the other way around. And so as you're walking again in yieldingness to the Lord and drawing upon his strength, obedience then can flow into your life in the various areas that the Spirit of God convinces you of, and you can do what you do heartily as on to the Lord. Then there's the emphasis on externals instead of internals, such as hair and dress codes to be spiritual. Very common in Baptist circles to have a, a dress code, a, got to dress a certain way and come into church. Now, I'm not against people dressing up. If they want to dress up as honor the Lord, praise the Lord. But once you make it a requirement, and as a result, in a sense, say, well, if you're really spiritual, you'd be dressing this way, then obviously this becomes problematic. Now, there can be a place of appropriateness, but let's not confuse the two. Let's not think because someone's dressed up and their hair is cut short that they're spiritual because the fact is they may be self-righteous, arrogant, proud, carnal to the core, and judging everyone else who's not measuring up to their standard while they pat themselves on the back thinking they are spiritual when in reality there's nothing of the spirit with that kind of thinking. That's all fleshly thinking. And to be carnally minded is death and to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And what a difference between the two. The Pharisees were the first God wants to make us like Jesus Christ, full of grace and truth in the center. And then there's the legal teaching of tithing instead of grace giving. And again, this isn't limited to Baptists. Many Pentecostals teach this as well and so forth. The fact of the matter is the New Testament doesn't teach for the church age believer tithing. As one Baptist pastor said, just Pay your bill to God. The first bill that you should pay every time is your 10% to God. No, we're not paying a bill. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. I heard a Baptist pastor one day talking about, now as a member of this Baptist church, you have certain commitments and responsibilities you have promised to do. So you need to do them. You know what you're thinking? Well, you're doing them as unto the church instead of doing it as unto the Lord as you're walking in joyful fellowship with him and a rod and directed of the Holy Spirit. What a difference. When it comes to tithing, that whole approach, you don't have to pray. You don't have to be in fellowship. You don't have to commune. You just write out the check or give your money, pay your 10%. And then people pat you on the back as if you're spiritual. And oftentimes, it's not rot of the spirit at all. Now, if you want to give 10%, that's fine. That's between you and the Lord. If someone wants to give 5 or 15 or 12 or this time this and that time next, next time that, that's between them and the Lord. Read 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 on grace giving, and you will see what a significant difference there is in the whole mindset of the grace-oriented believer. And then under baptistic, legalistic Christian life teaching, there's a failure to understand areas of Christian liberty. And as a result, they oftentimes make issues of Christian liberty, issues of spirituality, 
And they don't allow, again, for to agree to disagree on these areas that the Bible does not command or condemn. And that's what an area of Christian liberty is. It's an area in which the Bible doesn't command you and the Bible doesn't condemn it. And everyone has to be persuaded in their own mind. And the illustration Paul uses in Romans 14 is the issue of diets and days. 1 Corinthians chapters 8, 9, and 10, similar kind of issue. And if you are not able to think principally, and all you think in terms of do this or don't do that, you will struggle in this area of Christian liberty. Because grace living demands principled thinking. As the Christian life is lived right between your ears, as you respond to the Lord and respond to his word, and you think principally, Therefore, you can make applications as needed in various ways instead of having this strict legal approach to the Christian life. Furthermore, there's often an emphasis on visible areas of service to, quote, serve the Lord. And so when you talk to people, they're so, well, well, I'm not really serving the Lord, really. What does that mean? Well, I'm not an usher. I don't teach Sunday school, whatever. I guess I'm not serving the Lord. Wait a second. Everything you do as a believer should be service to the Lord. And while you learn to walk with the Lord, the Spirit of God may in turn use you in some kind of visible ministry. But what about those that aren't in some official ministry of that, that say they are carnal? And that the ones involved in visible ministry are spiritual? In reality, that may, it may even be reversed. That's, again, a failure to understand the Christian life by grace. Furthermore, there's an overemphasis on church discipline to produce change. Now, I'm not against church discipline understood correctly in the context of grace relative to 1 Corinthians 5, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and so forth. Titus chapter 3, 10 and 11, etc. There is a place, but it wasn't the norm, it was the exception. There wasn't an overemphasis on it. Because believers were encouraged how to walk with the Lord in their own personal love relationship with him from day to day. How to take heed to themselves and to the doctrine. How to take the beam out of their eye first. How to use 1 John 1, 9 if we confess our sins. And as a result, learn how to walk with the Lord. And handle failure in your Christian life. And while there are times when church discipline may be necessary when you have an ongoing, unrepentant, sinful situation with a believer in the church, again, it was rare. Just remember in 1 Corinthians, of all the carnality that was true in that church, only the person in ongoing, unrepentant sexual immorality in 1 Corinthians 5 was church discipline. Oftentimes in Baptist churches, they're doing it left and right to try to keep people in line. And oftentimes what it does produce, or at least potentially can, is a lot of phoniness and people not being willing to be transparent and say, I'm struggling or I'm having a problem here or whatever. Because if they say too much, either one, they weren't saved, or number two, they get church discipline, so why are you going to talk about it and seek help? And it produces just this legalistic phoniness that is really unfortunate. Furthermore, number five area we're, why we're not a Baptist church is oftentimes there's an emphasis on numbers. If you've ever been around Baptists, a lot of times that's what they're talking about all the time. I remember I ran into a Baptist evangelist, a couple of them in El Salvador here a year or so ago, and in doing so, they were quick to tell me that this week, 1,202 souls were saved through their ministry that week in El Salvador, 1,202. I was thinking, how in the world did you know it was 1,202? Because obviously they raised hands, they signed cards, they counted up, whatever, whatever. Now keep in mind, numbers are mentioned in the New Testament. In the book of Acts, for example, 3,000 were saved in the day of Pentecost. 5,000 a little later is mentioned and so forth. Now, why are those numbers mentioned? To show the progress of the gospel. But keep in mind, there is a great difference between noting what the Lord is doing versus making that your targeted objective and then using it as a sense and a badge of spirituality 
And oftentimes, again, in Baptist circles, there's a big emphasis. Because in reality, if you're a Baptist evangelist and you can't show that this many souls are saved or this many people were baptized, they begin to think you are a failure. Because there's this emphasis on numbers. A sixth area is what we can call the King James only problem with some. Now, not all Baptists hold to this, but this is especially true in independent fundamental Baptist circles in which they believe that the only English translation that is acceptable is the King James Version. Now, we haven't had a chance to really talk about this much in Gibbs, but let me just say this. I enjoy the King James. We use the King James for years here at Duluth Bible Church. We changed to the new King James about 20 years ago because... Number one, the language in the King James is getting archaic. People don't use it. They don't understand it. Uh, number two, sometimes the meaning of the words have totally reversed. Number three, we wanted to increase readability. Number four, we aren't convinced it's the only translation. Nor do we think it, there's been intentional objectives on the part of the New American Standard and such to corrupt the biblical text. You know, frankly, if they were trying to do that, they did a very bad job at it because in the New American Standard, for example, the deity of Christ comes out sometimes better than the King James. But you see, this has become in some circles the issue of orthodoxy. Of, of doctrinal purity if you hold to the King James Version. Now, sometimes when people tell me this, I ask them, so which version of the King James do you use? I mean, because, you know, the one we're presently using is a revision of the revision of the revision of the revision, at least, if not more, times. They say, oh, the 1611, the authorized. Well, the fact is you're not using an authorized. You're using several revisions of that, and in addition to that, if you've ever seen a 1611, I have one, it's very hard to read because a lot of the words, how they spelled them and such is difficulty. And then there's the discussion, so are we talking about the Oxford version or the Cambridge version? Because they're not identical, there is a word difference, and so forth. And now you start going down this path of utter confusion but again, in some circles, if you're not quoting a King James, you're just not biblical. Now, frankly, if I were asked to speak in a church like that, I would probably just use a King James. You know, um, why create an issue that doesn't need to be created? I'm fine with the King James Version. I just don't think it's the only translation. And in some circles, you almost have double inspiration, not only of the original pass, the original manuscripts, but also now the King James Version. And frankly, to take that view is heretical. Furthermore, if the King James Version is the only, quote, kind of semi-inspired English translation, what is the inspired translation in the French or the German or the Swahili? What if the Bible translators in some language in Papua New Guinea had a Bible translation theory, theory that was less than a literal translation, was more a dynamic equivalent. Is that the word of God or not? For that tribe. See, there's all kinds of problems with that. Number seven, they have predominant topical preaching versus expository and verse-by-verse -verse preaching. Now, that's changed somewhat over the last 30 years because of the emphasis or influence of John MacArthur, who was big into expository preaching. But typically... In Baptist circles, oftentimes it's our text for the day is, and they would read the verse and then make some comments, maybe cross-reference a little. But you didn't really work your way through a book of the Bible over a period of time, verse by verse by verse, which again is the way God wrote it. It's the way it should be read. It should be the way it's studied. Best way to keep things in context and so forth. And so I just mentioned this. But if you stop and you think with me for a moment, of all the different things that I have sought to clarify or as to why we're not a Baptist church, the bottom line is this. The emphasis is on the visible instead of the invisible. 
How do you get saved? Visible. Come forward, pray a prayer, ask Jesus in your heart. How do you, how do you join the church? The visible. You've got to get water baptized, signed on the dotted line. How are you spiritual? The visible. You come forward, dedicate your life. How do you give? You don't have to think. Just pay your bill to God, your 10%. And over and over again, the, it's all on the visible instead of the invisible personal relationship with the Lord that you're having as you walk by faith just as you've received Christ, as you grow in grace, as you serve him because you're moving beyond the visible to the invisible realm of the Spirit of God using the Word of God in your thinking. So there's a great difference. In fact, what can you learn from the story of Jonah and the greatest, quote, revival of the Old Testament? That ultimately it's not about the man, it's about the message. And that's the key word you want to remember for this. If you're going to be faithful to the Lord to do God's will, God's way, according to God's word, the message is supreme. Because we're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're teaching the truth of the word of God. That's the message we've been entrusted with, and we want to be faithful in presenting it. We want to be clear in how we preach the gospel. We want to be clear in how we explain the Christian life. And remember, part of that clarity is explaining not only what it is, what it is not. And that's why I hope that what we covered regarding Baptist churches today might even help clarify in your thinking what spirituality is versus what it is not lest you get ensnared in this legalistic kind of thinking. Now, in light of that, your assignment for next time is I want you to read the emphasis and distinctives of Duluth Bible Church, a little booklet that you will have available to you to read. And also, I want you to watch or listen to my message on clearing up some crucial confusion on sanctification. You can go online and you can listen to it. It's from the 2013 DBC Pastors Conference. Take notes and send them to Pastor Tom here by April 29th. That's obviously for our on-site students at this present time. That deadline is. And we'll try to put those links with you or to you regarding the email that is sent your way so that you can, again, uh, make sure that you accomplish this assignment in a timely way. This is going to reinforce what I've talked about today, and I trust it will be helpful to you, because for you to be in the Grace Institute of Biblical Studies and not understand the teaching of grace relative to the three tenses of salvation and not being able to discern the difference between us and a legalistic approach to the Christian life is, would be very problematic. We want you to understand this well. Now, I'm not suggesting that no one should ever go to a Baptist church. I'm just saying these are the things you need to be aware of that are oftentimes what is characteristic. Now, some of them may not be deal breakers in themselves, but oftentimes there's an overall emphasis that's legalistic in each of these different areas, and it becomes problematic to really, again, kind of hook up your wagon to that kind of situation. And so may you be prayerful and discerning about this. And if indeed you're a pastor of a Baptist church, as I'm explaining this to you, hopefully these things will not be true of you or of your local church by the grace of God. And by the way, whatever things we see here at Duluth Bible Church or the Grace Institute, it's only by the grace of God. May we not get haughty. May we not get puffed up regarding this. And remember that even the truths we do understand, we don't apply as well as we ought. And that's why we need the Lord every day. But in doing so, we certainly want to be clear on sound doctrine so that we can respond in appropriate ways and escape the snares of legalism, mysticism, asceticism, and license, as all of them pervert the message of grace. 
I trust this is helpful to you. Our Father, we pray that you could use these truths in our lives to clarify these issues and that our lives could be lived for your glory on the basis and means of grace, doing your will, your way. We pray in Jesus' name.